talk, and I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity. I did, <laughs> I did give a talk in this room uh, once before on 16th of November 2005 at 3.10 p.m. <laughs> you that can use the same notation. <laughs> I will not assume that you came to that talk. That was before conversations in this room were recorded. So what happened in Princeton stayed in Princeton. <laughs> Um, and uh, that was a year, a special year, when Alex Lubotsky was a distinguished visiting professor. Actually, he was in Simone Hall 113. So he would have to be. Get to your joke. No, no, I have another joke. I have another joke. Uh, <laughs> you might like it. Okay. I was about to say that if um, there is a book. Uh, he should be in the prequel to the book Who Got Sarnak's Office, right? <laughs> so the, uh, no, no, but the, about the talk, uh, well, I'll skip maybe the, no, maybe not. Uh, when do I have to stop at three? Yeah? Yeah, 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, so Alex was running the program and this was an opening workshop and um, uh, November and, and in October, Jean and I just proved the uniform expansion bounds for scaling graphs of SL2P. And of course, Alex wanted Jean to speak at the workshop. And, um, and the reason that, that participants were stuck with me was Jean, um, was Jean was reluctant to speak on the subject, which in his mind, he has not completely mastered. <laughs> so, and so I gave this talk, uh, but as those of you who read the paper know there are parts of this paper, say, dealing with non-commutative version of Balogh Simredi Gower Slema due to Tau, which I myself did not completely master at that time. So during the talk, there were some uh, very enlightening and tense moments when the experts in the audience tried to prove quite successfully that they were, in fact, the experts and I was not. <laughs> and <laughs> So today I will uh, try not to uh, address myself to the experts in the audience, you know, so, so to speak, the top 5%, but uh, to the forgotten middle class, <laughs> so to speak. Uh. So anyway, the um, work I'm going to speak about is joint with Jean Bourguin and Peter Sarnak, and it started here. I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll... I'll discuss briefly the motivation and history in a moment. Uh, let me start with um, how am I supposed to? I can start here, yeah? Where did you start in 2005? <laughs> <laughs> no, I start, I go, we go back to 1879. 18 <laughs> 1879, <laughs> 1880. <laughs> it's okay. Actually, something happened in June of, um, if you are so, uh, I have a demanding audience, but I'm ready. No, today I have no fear because that talk, this talk I had 12 years to prepare, so <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it actually is bad to have too much time. To but something happened in June of Okay, uh, it's in my bag somewhere. Uh, I'll tell you, I forgot the months. But anyway, this is Markov. Um, Markov, this is uh, Andrei Andreevich Markov, the elder of Markov Chain's fame. And this is um, his thesis. So the Markov equation is a very simple equation. A mark of triples are uh, um, positive integer solutions. Mark of numbers are um, coordinate of a mark of triple.
And there is a subtle distinction, which I will not dwell on, but there is also a notion of a Markov sequence, which is the largest, largest coordinate of a Markov triple counted with multiplicity. Now, I am always tempted to say a word about what. So this equation appears at the end of Markov's papers, which were in Mathematics and Allen. And so how many people have heard of Markov numbers? I guess this is a select audience. How many people have heard of Markov chains? Right, so the same, the same. But this is his deeper work. Maybe Markov chains is more consequential. Um, so I'll tell you very, very, I'll take, a, mo I'll take a, a few minutes to tell you what, uh, I'll tell you, so Markov proved an infinite sequence of theorems. I'll tell you the first two. So, okay. So there is a result which is uh, usually attributed to Hurwitz, and in fact Hurwitz did give a very a beautiful proof but it's already in Marcos' work. And this is the following. So um, an irrational number admits uh, infinitely many rational approximations p over q such that alpha minus p over q is less than 1 divided by square root of 5 Q squared, and this is sharp. If alpha is GL to Z equivalent to the golden ratio. Okay. Now, the second result. Now, on Wikipedia, it says that Chebyshev was Markov's doctoral advisor. This is not. Correct. Chebyshev was on his committee, but the advisors were Korkin and Zolotarov. Now, what I wanted to tell you about the June event. So, Zolotarov, okay, actually, I have this. So, on June 26, 1878, you might not know this, Zolotarov took the morning train from St. Petersburg traveling in the on the Warsaw Lane to the station Siverskaya, where relatives were staying at their summer cottage. At Alexandrovskaya station, he alighted, and when the train started off again, he fell under the engine. He was extricated from under the wheels with crushed left foot and right leg broken above the knee and transported to the St. Petersburg Alexandrovskaya hospital, where he died after 12 days of agony. But before dying, he sent a letter to <laughs> Korkin in which the proof of this result is contained. <coughs> Don't get, this is the last death. It's a safe field, no? This is a, so this is in 1878. And the result is that if alpha is not GL to Z equivalent to theta 1, then there are infinitely many rational approximations p over q such that alpha minus p over q is one is less than one over square root of eight q squared. This is sharp. If alpha is gl to z equivalent to theta two equal to one plus square root of two. Now, Markov proves an infinite number of these theorems. Let me just write the formula, and then you'll see what I mean. Uh, so this is less than mj, j's Markov number, divided by square root of 9 mj squared minus 4, 1 over q squared. Now, golden ratio, I just say, golden ratio, everybody knows. It appears all over the place. But the, so yes, so I, I have here an uh, ample cone. <laughs> the, so if you look at the, so the pattern of, say, pineapple, or there is an article by Coxeter in Journal of Algebra, 1972, where he described, 
where he explains how the pattern of scales is determined mostly by the go golden ratio, but occasionally the second mark of the, but occasionally it is determined by this one, and this is one of them. Um, so this is a fundamental equation with exotic features, which I'm about to describe. The paper, so I'm not going to do justice to motivation and what Markov did. The paper I would recommend is a paper by Bombieri called the Markov tree. And the Markov tree is the following um, object which OK, so there is one solution which is staring at you in the face, 1, 1, 1. There is a solution which is 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 5, 1, 5, 13, 2, 5, 29, 1, 13, 34, 5, 13, 194, 229, 169, 529, 433. And let me just add one more note to indicate the rapid growth. 29, 433, 37666. Okay. And the mark of numbers are read off from this tree um, as follows. So I actually, <laughs> I can do, OK, I think that's better. So, so, one, so one is what gives you the, one is what gives you the golden ratio, two, Five, thirteen, twenty-nine, thirty-four, eighty-nine, um, one hundred and sixty-nine, one hundred and ninety-four, two hundred and thirty-three, four hundred and thirty-three. Dot dot dot. So what am I doing? If you look at this equation as a quadratic equation in x1, then you see that the two solutions are related simply um, as x1 plus x1 prime is equal to 3x2, x3. So having one, if you have one solution, you can obtain another solution by applying what is called Vieta involution. And the group generated by these three involutions, when you act at the root solution, is what gives you the Markov tree. So the Markov tree can be viewed as an orbit under the action of gamma of the root solution. I want to. R one should go to x two, x three, and the other root. R one, so R two would do two x two what R one does to x one. R three would do two x three. So there are also permutations in this group, which will be important. But. Um, Sorry? It does not match up with this one necessarily. It's OK. It's OK. I, 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 have, some, I have some coffee. <laughs> this is coffee. Um, is it being recorded? 
our conversation. Okay, no, that's fine. I, I didn't offend anybody so far. I didn't say much either. Okay, let's. Okay, moving forward. Are there any questions so far? Yes, please. I am um, just, well, what I'm saying is that all the integer, and I'm not proving it. What I'm saying is that, that what I'm saying <coughs> without proving it, and that's in Marcos' paper, is that all the integral solution of that equation can be obtained from the root solution. Yeah, but why don't you add, put, put it to add loops here? That takes a bit of a proof. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a complete triviality, but uh, okay. we can, it's not. So by descent, you would prove that you obtain everything from the root solution, but the fact that it is, in fact, a tree takes, uh, well, trust me. It's showing the same thing. All of these things are trivial, but I have little time, and I made too many jokes. Bear with me. <laughs> the, um, no more jokes. I'm going to be very businesslike and proceed in a systematic manner. Um, I'm capable of doing that. that that's what Trump says. I can be very presidential. Um, uh, I lost, I'm already lost my, uh, I should start giving talks with a teleprompter, I think. Then. <laughs> I'm looking for the next, what, what, I had a plan. One, two, three. Okay, three, plan. <laughs> I'm following my plan. Number, okay, I put it, some, okay, here. Then nobody, here, I'm going to be following my plan. Oh, I'm supposed to raise, okay. Okay. Okay, so, I oh know, I have another blackboard. So, following the, okay. Following the publication, the first reference, I keep it here, then it, it Okay, so following the publication, the first reference to Markov's work <coughs> is a paper by Hurwitz. That is what um, Ryan will be talking about, where Hurwitz looks at the equation, um, which is the following. So Hurwitz, 1907, he looks at the following equation, and he so he says, he says, I, I want to find n tuples of integers such that the sum of the squares is divisible by their product. And then at some point he gets to n equals 3 and says this equation in fact appears in Markov's work. But the motivation for this equation is what I just, and then in 1913, Frobenius wrote a very important paper. And he is, uh, he is clearly very impressed with Markov. Uh, he says uh, it's fantastic results, and uh, uh, and he says it's very surprising nobody read this paper, nobody is quoting. Minkowski doesn't quote them. Minko and Frobenius, uh, Frobenius was not easily uh, impressed. I think he once was asked to write a letter for Hilbert, and he said he is a rather good mathematician, but he will never be as good as Schottky. So uh, there are many things happening in this paper, but in particular, he makes a conjecture, which is still open, asserting that m is equal to ms. And it's not going to be important in what follows. It's convenient to assume that it's true. OK, and then the next result that uh, I want to state, it was mentioned already in Arthur's talk, but I want to. So can I use a normal eraser? It's better yeah. to. OK. So maybe this, this is a blackboard I certainly don't need. So it is surprising that this question was not looked at earlier because Markov's academic grandfather was Chebyshev, and he certainly was aware of you know, counting some <laughs> sets of integers. But the question 
of the number of Markov numbers. So let me, in view of uh, sort of, I will use the notation uh, to set up um, with a view towards Ryan stuff. Let me denote this variety by x. And let me uh, state the result as the assertion that this is, um, so the number of Markov numbers up to t is uh, OK, so this result was first proved in a thesis of Gurwood in uh, 1976. It's a thesis jointly supervised by Shapiro and Newman. And he proves this by comparing Markov tree with Fari tree. Zagier gets a better error term uh, by comparing it with Euclid tree. And then there are papers by Mirzakhani and McShane Riven. And a very beautiful <coughs> proof is also contained in the last paper of Bailey. The, the best error term here to date, I believe, is given by log t, log log t. And, and Ryan is going to discuss this question for Hurwitz surfaces, where the answer following Professor Barger's thesis is quite different and surprising. So what I just want to point out is that Markov numbers are sparse. Nth Markov number is um, roughly a to the square root of n. OK, I'm not doing too badly, so I can say a word about Motivation. I didn't know anything about Markov numbers until August of 2005 when I got a letter from Peter. There was this program I was coming. He said, I have an interesting problem related to your thesis. And, and Peter would correct me if what I'm about to say is wrong. So my understanding is that it was Venkatesh and Linden Strauss who asked you a question which can be stated as other infinitely many square free Markov numbers, basically. And that was related to the work that we're doing related to Duke's equal distribution. Associated with this irrationality, there are geodesics. I, I later saw that you wrote a review of Kohn's papers on Markov numbers. So I didn't know. Uh, anyway, the question that was asked in 2005, in August, there was this uh, school in China on number theory. And the question that they asked, translated into the language that I'm using now, is are there infinitely many square free Markov numbers? And, and I think the question was asked while, while the sound Arjan was giving lectures on sieve theory. Anyway, Peter had a great insight that this question leads to the following one, which is still open. So the question that this leads to is the following. If you reduce this tree mod p, actually, you need, it to you need to reduce it mod square free moduli. But if you reduce this tree mod p, you get a family of graphs called Markov graphs, which appear for the first time in Norse's thesis, actually. Uh, do they form a family of expanders? OK. And that's uh, what was asked. We still, although numerical evidence is quite convincing that they are. Um, what we just proved, basically, is that they are connected. And what happened was there were these developments with super strong approximation and uh, other things. So what happened is that instead, the past 10 years, so very um, uh, rapid and I think one can say basically complete development, which Alex was talking about in the context of what is now called a fine linear sieve. And all I don't know is whether it makes sense for me to very quickly compare this to the Apollonian circle packing, very quickly, just to indicate the parallels. So you all saw what the, I will just, just take a moment. It's instructive because you see what the differences are. So Apollonian. Uh, okay, so the equation that is uh, the equation then is um, 
the Descartes equation, OK, th this was not a good idea. I'm all over the place. Sorry? I know. Yes, that's, thank you. Uh, so actually, the Princess of Bohemia also obtained a proof. It's very interesting. That you have a complete correspondence between Descartes and this Princess of Bohemia online. This is one of their first letters. Then they start discussing mind-body problem. It's a story. OK, so no more jokes. OK, this I'm going to focus. So this is, of course, the equation uh, describing the curvatures of four mutually tangent circles. So here, of course, you have this. Um, um, again, you can, if you view this equation as a quadratic equation in x1, you uh, see that x1 plus x1 prime is equal to 2x2 plus 2x3 plus 2x4. And so x1 prime is given by minus x1 plus 2x2 plus 2x3 plus 2x4. But the transformation that you obtain now is a linear one. And uh, so the, the Apollonian group is generated by four of these. And um, the quadruples of Apollonian uh, curvatures. Now, what I also want to say is that the sequence that you get here is sparse, but not nearly as sparse. So if you count the number of elements in the orbit such that the norm of gamma A is less than T, then this grows like t to the delta, where delta is the house of dimension of the limit set. So in the one dimension lower, you can get delta arbitrarily close to 0. But so the sequence would be sparse, but not nearly as sparse as this. So the, qui the problem we are dealing with here is in the level of difficulty, um, Is the level of difficulty much simpler? Sorry, 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 sorry. Yes, I, I should. I have time. Uh, what am I trying to say? So the problem we are dealing with is better than that addressed in a fine linear C, where by now we have a complete understanding of both expansion and so we can say that not only there are infinitely many square-free numbers, but there are infinitely many numbers which are product of a finite number of primes. It is, so the problem we're dealing with here, because the transformation is much harder than this one, but it is simpler than the case of Torrey, where the strong approximation assertion basically amounts to Artin's conjecture. So let me perhaps before I f before uh, before I start discussing the actual strong approximation results and techniques, let me state theorem three. So theorem three is that almost as I said, this is all joint work with uh, Burgain and Sarnak, and there is paper one which is posted, and paper two should be posted by the end of the year, uh, God willing. Uh, the um, almost all. Markov numbers are composite. OK, now, when you first see this result, it doesn't sound very impressive. You know, almost all numbers are composite. But even that takes a bit of a proof. This was the second result that Euler approved after proving that there are infinitely many primes. This shows that there are not too many. And in fact, if you look 
at this sequence at the beginning, there are many, many primes. And if you are trying to prove this type of result for sequences which are sparse, it is quite hard. So it is not known. So if you look at the sequence of numbers which one can call, I guess, fully numbers, then it is not known whether there are infinitely many. The, it, it is not known whether almost all of them are composite. Even assuming generalized Riemann hypothesis, which allowed Hulli to give a conditional proof of Artin's conjecture, it is not known. He had to make an additional hypothesis. I'm sorry, what do you mean by almost all? I mean that if you count the, I cannot think when I'm at the blog, I'll just copy. It's, I, I know what, I, what I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, I'll write the exact statement is the exact statement is as follows. So I'm uh, counting the. I'm counting. We have a we have a typo in the conference announcement. Um, Um, prime um, so that's what I mean Okay, so now I have to tell you what themes one and two are. But before doing that, I have to let me formulate the basic. <laughs> let me formulate the basic uh, conjectures um, that. Um, wait, give me a sec. I just want to. I don't want to get confused anymore here, because there is no reason for this. I'll just remove all of these papers. OK, now we're in good shape. So I define Markov graphs informally. I think you all understood what I mean by that. I reduce a tree mod p, and I get a graph, except one thing that I should, uh, one thing that I should, um, and what I should also say that I'm just talking about Markov equation. The results and methods that I'm going to discuss in the last third of the talk are, are applicable to more general equations. One of them we'll see in a moment. So this, uh, this point that I'm going to remove will appear to be a cosmetic uh, thing that I'm doing. But in more general situations, it is essential to perform this first. So the graphs are going to have a vertex set. Uh, uh, which so um, Markov graphs. There is a paper. By the way, the term Markov chain appears for the first time in the paper by Frobenius. He, says he calls this tree Markov Shanketan. There is a paper by Castles called The Markov Chain. So, um, I'm, I'm going to define it for I'm going to define it. I, I'm going to define it, and I'm going to. Um, so, Uh, I'm going to not include this point. And what I said is that this sub uh, this makes sense. But what uh, what I probably should repeat is that for more general equations, there will be a set of finite orbits over complex numbers which has to be removed before you make a 
statement amounting to strong approximation. So these are so I'm looking at the points on this variety mod p. Okay? And then I connect the edge. So how to define a graph I have to tell you what the vertices are, I just told you, and then the edges are the same as I raise it. So and um, I, I join x to r1 of x, r2 of x, r3 of x. So, so you have no multiple edges? No, not in this case. Because it is a free group, so which okay. I'll tell you over coffee. How I for sufficiently large P for sufficiently large P these are regular graphs and there are subtle points which I <coughs> would love to discuss but I would not be allowed to So then the conjecture, so there is a strong approximation conjecture. Asserting that these are connected. And there is a good. We we talk we talk we go for a walk we discuss <laughs> the um, and the super strong approximation conjecture would be that they expanders and what I should say is that these graphs first appeared in Professor Bargar's thesis we made the conjecture in uh, 2005, but the first time it appeared in print was in the paper uh, of Macalo and Wanderley, um, which is called Nielsen equivalence of generating pairs of S L to P, and I just want to very quickly explain the connection. I'm sorry. No, the question. Author's thesis is publicly available, and it's a great thesis. And the graphs, uh, there is a pictures of graphs, and he also p observes that the majority of numbers at the beginning are prime. The conjecture in the form that uh, it, uh, so the, the first time it appears in print is in the paper of McCallum and Wanderley. Uh, in, um, 2013, and it's called the Nielsen equivalence of generating pairs of SL to P, and this is made in the context of what is called product replacement graph, which is the following. So there is a notion of a product replacement graph. I will not have time to explain what. I'll just give the definition. It is something that is used to produce very quickly a random element in a, it gives you a black block, black it produces a random element in a group, even if you don't know what the group is. That's called black box algorithm. I'm not joking. This is not a joke. It works as follows. So you take k generators, and then you pick two of them, and you multiply on the left or on the right. And then what the people working in computational group theory observed is that this converges very quickly to a random element. And the graphs that I'm about to describe is what is so the so given a so given a finite group, you define this graph as follows. So vertices. So G is a finite group, product replacement graphs. So the vertices um, K tuples of generators. And you connect them by essentially Nielsen transformations. So the edges 
are given by uh, the following operation. So you multiply this And similarly, you define Lij plus minus. OK, and one of them, what am I, d I I'm not using the blackboard efficiently. OK, uh, OK, one of the first results, in fact, I think the first result in this area is due to Gilman, who in 1977, proved that the product replacement graph of SL2P for k greater or equal than 3 is connected. And he proved more. He proved that the action is, uh, so that the full group acts as alternating or symmetric group, and the methods that he used were recently used by Puder and Mieri to prove that in the cases where we prove connectivity, this will be theorems 2 and 3, uh, 1 and 2. Uh, I'll make it. What they prove using the methods very close to that of Gilman, that the action is, uh, at least in the case when prime is congruent to 1 mod 4, is a full alternating group. OK, this is connected. Now in, this is 77. Now uh, in 2006, uh, Pak and I, proved that, uh, again, when k is greater or equal than 3, the expanders, if SL2P is strongly uniformly expanding, that is to say expanding for all generators. And this, um, uh, Breyer and myself um, proved is uh, true for infinitely many primes of density one. Now for k equals two, the situation is very different because of the Fricke identity which is um, the following. So for k equals uh, 2, if you take two matrices, A and B, in SL2, you have that the following relation is true. So trace square of A plus trace square of B plus trace square of AB is equal to trace of A, trace of B, trace of AB plus trace of the commutator plus 2. So you see that this is an equation which is basically the Markov equation when the trace of the matrices is equal to minus 2. So what they conjecture is that this is the only abstraction basically to connectivity and the methods of proof that we have. So the theorems that I state now are also, oh, I have a brilliant idea. I don't have to erase. Watch. My blackboard is new. It's not as. I think it might just work. If I find. Very good. So, yes. OK, so theorem one. So, so these results, I, as I said, they hold for m more general varieties. and. For theorem 3, we need them for square-free moduli, for which we have a proof in paper 2. An independent proof follows from the work of uh, Pud and Mieris that I mentioned. Because once you prove that the action is as a full alternating group, you can pass uh, using, uh, how do you pronounce the name? Goursault. Goursault's lemma uh, to square-free moduli, that's necessary. So the first theorem is that this. Um, Markov graphs have um, 
giant connected uh, component, which we call a cage. Um, well, you must see the proof to. So the complement, so what is not in the connected component is very small. Note that the size of the Markov graphs is roughly p squared. Uh, the second result has been recently improved. The, the second part of the statement I'm about to make has been recently improved by um, Spalinski and collaborators. But let's state, I state what we proved, which is uh, that uh, the every gamma orbit satisfies um, the bound, which is log p to the one third. And the paper of Spalinski and collaborators improves this. The second theorem is the following. So let E be the set of primes for which strong approximation fails. This set is also very small. So if you look at the uh, number of these exceptions up to t, this is less than t. Thank you very much.